things as they stand, in my opinion, the, the supply side situation is, is towards the upside. So I do see the price of oil falling further. Now, there is a lot of commentary out there. Could we, could we see a repeat of uh, uh, the oil price between sort of say 35 to 40 dollars within the next, uh, uh, next sort of six months or so? What I, what I would say, it is possible. But what will then happen is that we will have a supply correction. Some people say that is probably OPEC's uh, intention or let's say Saudi Arabia's intention. But how this will work is that if the oil price uh, continues to fall, we will reach a point where by which some of the oil and gas exploration projects would, uh, would won't be very feasible. Now, they'll still get financed, but they'll get financed at a premium. Few oil and gas companies, especially the bigger ones, can still afford it. But some of the smaller independent upstarts, the, the chaps who have led this shale revolution, uh, as, it's as it's called, would, would be in trouble. Now, there are also a lot of capital intensive projects uh, around the world. We, we can talk about the Canadian oil sands or closer to our neck of the woods. We can look at the, the west of Shetland uh, developments uh, and, and so on and so forth. Some of these projects won't be very profitable if the oil price goes below, say, $50 uh, a barrel. Now, when we cross that, when, when that particular floor is breached, we will have a few doubts creeping in. Some of these project financiers will think, you know, let's, uh, let's mothball things for a while. Let's put some of these things on, on, on ice. I'm not saying per se that these projects would be cancelled because when some of these projects are being worked on, it's, it's not about the here and the now. It's about, it's about looking long term, four or five years from now. Yet, the, the direction of the market has a heavy influence. So a lot of people might decide, let's put things on ice. And then, see, this is, it, it, it's a very interesting connect. As these projects get sort of uh, get, go through a cooling off period, you will see that the supply starts trickling down. So there will be an how shall I say? It's not the best of expressions, but perhaps it's 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 the wise expression that there'll be a, a, an auto correction on the supply side. And of course, it's a supply and demand. Well, the first sign that the market gets that there is a there is a, a, a supply uh, correction, the price will start going up, and now, now look at the demand centers. Right now, a lot of people are, are sort of worried about the demand in China, and that worry is, uh, is a valid one. Uh, Chinese data, if in, not just, not just uh, the here and now, if you look, look at the last 12 months, you'll get one set of good Chinese economic data, then there'll be an, another couple of sets of bad data, there'll be a couple of sets of mixed data. So there is no constant signal from China that uh, that we should take their demand as it was, say, in 2012 or 2013. 2015 is going to be different. The first six months uh, of next year, uh, uh, the demand side of, uh, of the oil business is still going to be a little bit tricky. But I do see that come June, there will be an uptick in demand. So the midway point of roughly around the midway point of 2015. So we will see an uptick in Chinese demand. We should see an uptick in South Korean demand. We should see an uptick in Indian demand. Now, of the the, the sort of uh, big five importers, that be the the U.S., the South Koreans, the Indians, the Japanese, uh, and the Chinese. Uh, we should note that the U.S. has, uh, well, not totally retreated but retreated quite a bit from the global oil markets. They've got a lot of domestic uh, oil uh, coming on stream. So they're not buying as much. I'll give you a classic example. In 2010, the United States was importing roughly around 1.3 uh, million barrels uh, over a specified period of time from, from Nigeria uh, per day. It's now down to almost zero. So in, in a short space of... Uh, as many years and that is because the Nigerian crude is the closest to the US light crude you know, in terms of sulfur content, viscosity, however, whatever sort of measuring parameters you apply and Nigeria is suffering as, as a result. So Nigeria is now scrambling to find other buyers uh, for their crude. So where do they, what do they do? They, they, they do what comes naturally, head to Asian markets. Uh, Angola is doing the same. A lot of people who were exporting a lot to the United States are now looking towards Asia, which means uh, if you're a Chinese buyer or a procurement manager, 
Christmas came uh, uh, pretty early, I, sh I should say, because you're spoiled for choice. A major importer in the shape of the United States retreats from the market in some way, shape and form. The only other sort of big buyer in town, or at least the top of the pile, is China, followed by Japan and India and so, so on and so forth. But the Chinese are spoiled for choice. And lo and behold, they also aren't buying as much. So whatever they're buying, they're buying carefully. They're buying it uh, after heavy negotiations in a buyer's market. And this is the dynamic as it stands while we, uh, as we have this conversation. But it, I, I doubt if we'll, be, we'll still be here uh, come June. Why? Uh, one, one key point is, is that demand will pick up not just in China, uh, that's, that's my conjecture, not just in China, but in the wider Asia-Pacific region as well. Uh, you, you appreciate a lot of players in that part of the world are not uh, buying as much crude as they did at the same point in 2012. Uh, that's, that's my assessment. So if you look at it that way, uh, and we look at look at these players. Uh, some some of these uh, these Asian countries are will return to the market in more meaningful volumes, uh, importing more meaningful volumes, and suddenly you will have many of the uh, the the OPEC exporters, especially Nigeria and Angola, who are proactively uh, looking for Asian buyers, uh, feel that they've got more buyers on the market. And then that'll have, a, that'll have a bearing on how much crude is actually being, being imported. There's one more factor. Why is there so much oil out there? It's, uh, it's not just uh, the US shale. Uh, Libya is uh, in the middle of a crisis, but it'll probably surprise most of the, the viewers of this, uh, this, this clip to, to learn, is that Libya is still producing crude oil in meaningful volumes. Iraq itself, it's, it's facing an existential threat. There's, a, there's an unfolding human tragedy. But the anecdotal and empirical evidence that you'll get uh, from the port of Basra is that uh, the, the, oil, uh, the oil tankers are still getting loaded pretty much routinely. So the producers are not holding back. We had the Saudis the other day uh, announcing their second discount of their price. Uh, none of the producers are holding back. The Russians pumped uh, in September 2014, the Russians pumped more oil than they ever did at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So nobody is currently holding back. Why? Because they want to maintain their market share. They, they, they just don't want to give away. Who blinks? And what if one person blinks and the others don't blink? Now this is what happened at OPEC. What if OPEC decided to, to, to cut productions and the Americans didn't hold back or certain members within OPEC, let's say the Saudis, decided that, uh, you know what, we will not respect this, uh, this quarter cap. We'll just go on producing as much as we do. So that was OPEC's worry. What if they cut and nobody else cuts? And what will then happen is, interestingly, going back to the 1980s, what will then happen is that they will, like it happened in the 80s, they would have lost market share. And they do not. They do not want a repeat of the 1980s, especially the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, and and UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates, and uh, and I would I would probably add the Qataris to that list as well. Uh, these guys don't want to lose market share. Right now, OPEC as a whole has about 30 percent uh, of the global market um, on a daily basis, um, and I would say a lion's share of uh, of that 30 percent is is with the Saudis. And the Saudis don't want to go back to the to the 1980s, um, so that's why you know we, we have uh, we have a, a glut. There's just too much of the crude stuff uh, out there, and uh, the buyers are sort of holding back. And the few who are in the market uh, think uh, they can negotiate harder, especially with the U.S. Uh, not being uh, not being in play. Uh, and uh, that's that's the crux of the matter. But it, I I doubt if the situation would uh, would last beyond the summer. Um, right now, if you look at the state of affairs, uh, we are in the, uh, you know, the, the northern hemisphere of winter uh, is upon us. Uh, there, are, there are a few geopolitical tussles going on around the world. You know, the, essentially, the security situation in Nigeria hasn't fundamentally altered. In Iraq, it's, it's worsened. In Libya, Libya is pretty much uh, where it was. The, the internal politics is very complicated. It's a country with two prime ministers. Uh, two oil ministers, 
two administrations, but only one oil company, national oil company. So, so, the, so the, the geopolitical dynamic hasn't changed. The, the wider economics and the fact that there is so much oil out there is, is what is forcing uh, the price to you know, be, be on a, on a downward, uh, downward uh, curve. Um, I would say there will be some strength in the market uh, come the summer, uh, but, uh, but we, sh we shall have to see.